And thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I spent a little bit of time yesterday with the uh, local hoarding coalition. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we talked about there because I think it'll have relevance to, to what we're going to talk about uh, today here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wander around back and forth so that the people sitting behind the pillars can see me a, a little bit of the time and I can see you. Um, so let's... Uh, I, I don't know if you can read this caption to this cartoon, but it says, well, here comes Mr. Hunter and Gather with another useless treasure. Like this ancient hunter and gatherer, our world has come to be one dominated by possessions. For most of us, possessions provide us with a source of comfort and convenience and even pleasure. But if we were to lose the ability to judge the true value these possessions have for our lives, they can become a living hell. And that's just what's happened to people who suffer from compulsive hoarding. So what, we're, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to cover four topics. I'm going to talk a lot about the phenomenology. Now what I mean by phenomenology is the experience these people have in relationship to the things they own. It's important for anyone working with someone with a hoarding problem to understand this phenomenology because unless you can understand the place they're coming from, it's going to be hard for you to figure out how to work with them and how to deal with this problem. I'm going to talk about the diagnosis and assessment of this problem. There are some big, issue, big things coming in diagnosis of, of hoarding because it's, it's, it is in all likelihood going to be included in the next version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which comes out in the spring. So once that comes out, that's going to change the landscape for dealing with hoarding because it's now an official diagnosis. Also assessment, I'm going to talk about how we go about assessing this both in research and clinical work. I'm going to talk about then a conceptual model for the way in which to think about how all this goes together. Like phenomenology, it's important for those people dealing with this problem to understand a little bit about where it comes from, how to think about it in terms of, of the process of the development of this behavior and the likelihood that this behavior will change or, or be ameliorated in some way. And then finally, I want to talk about motivation and a little bit about intervention. I'm going to talk quite a bit about this issue of motivation because I'm sure you are all aware that when you get one of these cases, the one thing you're concerned about is, is this person motivated enough to do something about it? It's a big issue in hoarding, and it's one that we have to understand in a, in a pretty thorough way in order to, to deal with it effectively. And then intervention. And now, intervention. You know, most, most psychologists and mental health professionals talk about therapy, okay? Well, uh, we have developed a therapy for this, but I'm not going to talk much about that today. I'm going to talk about other strategies for intervention because when it comes down to it, therapy is not going to solve the problem that most of you face because there aren't enough therapists around who know how to do this therapy to do it. There aren't enough resources to pay these therapists. So what we have to do is to figure out some strategies for intervention that we can use in the current context of having basically very few resources to deal with this problem. Okay, so that's, those are the four things I'm going to cover. Uh, and th a lot of the, this material comes from these three texts. Now this is our, our treatment manual. This is the therapist guide. This is our cognitive behavior therapy for hoarding. And um, we've done quite a bit of research on this, and it, it seems to work reasonably well. But as I said, I'm not going to talk too much about that today. This is our self-help book, Buried in Treasures. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing with respect to developing a program that's based around this self-help notion. And Stuff is, um, is the most recent book out, and it is basically a book about hoarding. And it tells stories of people with this problem and puts them into a context that makes it, uh, I think, a little bit more understandable. And that's the one I have some copies of if people are interested in. OK. So when we started out this research, I started this research in the early 90s. And the first thing uh, we did was to try to come up with a definition of, of hoarding so we could get started. And the definition we came up with really has stuck pretty well and, in fact, has become the basis for the diagnostic criteria that are going into DSM-5. 
Uh, and the first part of this definition is a description of the behavior, the acquisition of and failure to discard a large number of possessions. That's a simple description of a set of behaviors. Unfortunately, this is, these are behaviors that probably describe all of us. We all acquire a lot of stuff, and we all keep a lot of stuff, far more than our ancestors ever did. So this behavior in and of itself is not all that unusual or not all that problematic. When hoarding becomes a problem, it becomes a problem because the living spaces become so cluttered that they cannot be used for their intended purposes. And that's when we start to see hoarding as a problem. And furthermore, there is significant distress or impairment that's caused by the clutter. I'm going to talk a lot about the nature of that impairment, the nature of the distress, and so forth. So hopefully by the end of the day, you have a pretty good sense of what this is like for people with this problem. All right, so to start, I'm going to walk you through a hoarding case. This is uh, the, the case of the woman is named Irene. We'll call her Irene. She is the main character in the book Stuff. So if you've read Stuff, you will, you will notice, you will recognize some of the things I say about her. Uh, I'm going to walk you through her house to give you a sense of, of what this problem is like and how we can put together this information about hoarding. Irene is 53 years old. She was 53 when she contacted me. She's got two children, and she contacted me because her husband just moved out. They'd been married quite a long time, and he finally got fed up, and he said, either you clear out the clutter, or I'm leaving. She couldn't do it, so he left. And now, in the ensuing divorce, she's worried about losing custody of her children. Uh, her hoarding began in childhood, so this has been a lifelong thing, but it only became really serious uh, when she was in her 20s and 30s. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is quite a, a, a long-standing problem, at least 30 years of pretty serious hoarding behavior when she came to me. <clears throat> and when she came to me, this was in the early 90s, and I had just finished an initial series of studies on hoarding. In fact, the first studies that had been reported in the psychiatric literature. And so she got wind of this, and she called me quite desperate, and I said, look, I... I don't know anything about hoarding, and nobody does. And I said, but I'll make a deal with you. I said, if you will agree to share with me everything that you experience, then I'll do whatever I can to help you, okay? But I want, to, I want to, for you to basically teach me everything that you experience with respect to this problem, and I'll do whatever I can to help. And I said, e even, if that be, e e even if you get so mad at me, you kick me out of your house, I want you to do that. I want you to be that open with me, which she did a couple of times. Uh, so that, that was our arrangement. Uh, and and I, I must say, Irene is absolutely the loveliest person I know. She has a master's degree. She's very bright. She's well-read. She is a great conversationalist. She knows lots about lots of things. She's just a sweet, sweet person. Uh, one of my favorite people, and very articulate about the nature of her experience. But for years, she's been suffering from this problem. And here is an example. <clears throat> so this is her kitchen. And I, I want you to notice certain things. Each of these pictures, I'm going to point things out because they start to pull together this story. Look at the surfaces. All the surfaces are covered. Okay. The, the, the tabletop is covered, underneath the table uh, is, is covered. There are things on top of the chairs, underneath the chairs, and so forth. Um, so every surface is covered. I want you to notice the nature of the things. I don't know how clearly you can see them here, but we have uh, light bulbs, newspapers. There's an egg carton, more newspapers, some ribbon, uh, telephone books, wrapping paper, a seemingly random assortment of things first clue, this random assortment of things. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to this issue of the, the seeming randomness of all this stuff. The second thing to notice, this is the only place here. This little triangle is the only open surface. This is where she eats her meals and where her children eat their meals. Clearly, they can't do it together. They have to do it in sequence. Okay? And they have to move stuff around in order to do it. Okay? 
So the next clue, that the nature of the impairment this causes, that the basic impairment or infringement on the basic daily activities of living. Uh, another complication you see over here, you see the stovetop, and what do we see right beside the stovetop? A pile of papers. This is not a very good arrangement. You, we have a, a, a heat source and a fuel source together, together with exits and things that are blocked here. This is a dangerous situation for her. Now, the complication here is that all this stuff right here beside the stove is clean. And all this stuff on the table, in Irene's eyes, all that stuff is contaminated. In addition to having a hoarding problem, she has a serious contamination obsession and some cleaning compulsion. So now, to deal with this problem, we have comorbidity. We have this hoarding problem and we have an OCD problem. Okay? So her life is quite complicated and disentangling it all and getting her through this mess is going to be difficult. This is her uh, dining room and you can see the pile of stuff goes up almost all the way to the chandelier. It's a little bit different in nature than what's in the kitchen, but still we have some plates, vases. These are pieces to games. Uh, these are books. And anybody know what these things are? Those are the plastic tops from, these, uh, from storage bins. This is something very, very characteristic in hoarding homes. Storage devices that end up being part of the clutter rather than part of the organizational scheme. Okay? That tells us something about Irene. She's trying to do something to organize all this stuff. But what's happening is that all her attempts at organizing end up simply contributing to it. Okay? A very common phenomena in hoarding. Along here, you see a little pathway. It's a one foot wide pathway. We call them goat paths. And it runs along this pile and then behind the pile on into the other part of the house. Again, very characteristic of these hoarding cases. Um, we often see these, these paths some one foot wide. In the most serious cases, the paths then begin to fill up. And in the most serious cases, then the room is, is inaccessible. You can't get into it. Um, this is a, a picture of the other side of the room. Uh, so we see the, the back part of this pile. We come along the path here, and I show it to you because this is one of the main entrances to her house. And clearly, she can't get in or out that way. Uh, it, it, in fact, the only way she can get into and out of her house is to go through the garage, which is a sea of stuff, and it's got a little pathway into the kitchen. Um, <clears throat> so if there were a fire and she were in this part of the house, she would never get out. She would die. This is her TV room. This is where she spends most of her time. This is where she keeps her important papers. <laughs> and and uh, there is a, a coffee table under here, but you can't quite see it. And here, as we were talking about this in my first visit and, and walk through the home, uh, you see this little corner of the couch here? The little bitty space there that's open. And what she told me was, I sit there every day for three hours, three hours every day, trying to organize all this stuff. Three hours every day, and it looks like this. There's something there. There's something wrong here. So I said, well, okay, why don't you sit down and do what you normally do and talk your way through it, and let me watch. And she said, okay. So she sat down. She reached over here in the pile, in the middle of the pile here, and she picked up an advertisement that was cut out of the newspaper. And it was an advertisement for a tire sale. A tire sale was a month or two ago. So it was not on anymore. And what she said was, my car needs new tires. But I don't have the money right now to buy them. So I, I want to know, when I get the money, I, I want to know where to go that has a good sale. And this place has good sales on tires. So I need to keep this. So I'm going to put this back on the pile here on top where I can see it. And she picked up the next thing, and it was a brochure from a resort in Vermont, in the northern kingdom of Vermont. She said, I've never, I've lived in Massachusetts my whole life, and I've never been to the northern kingdom. 
and I really want to go. And this looks like a great resort. And so I want to have this information when I'm ready. So, I'll, I, so it's important to me. So I'm going to put it here on top of the pile where I can see it on top of this tire ad, but I'm going to turn it a little bit so that I can see it as well. Again, these are clues. The third thing she pulled out was a brochure on how to talk to your kids about drugs. My daughter, 13-year-old daughter, my daughter's coming home in a couple weeks from school. She's away at school. And I, I have to have this conversation with her. So this is critical. So I have to keep this. So I'll put it on top of these other two. But I'll turn it so I can see all three of them. And on and on and on. So what happened in those three, what happens in those three hours is that she churns the pile. And she reviews and rehearses why each of these things is important to her. So she's confirming her decisions to keep them. Okay? And that's her strategy for getting out of this mess. All right? So we can see, you can see how ineffective that is. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about, uh, um, we'll come back and talk more about this strategy and what it means as we go along. Uh, this is her upstairs hallway, and it looks like much of the rest of the house. Inside these bags are gifts that she has purchased for other people and never given away. Over, been a, a, more than a decade, this stuff has been here. And what happens is quite characteristic. She's out somewhere, and she sees a sale. And she thinks to herself, that would make a great gift for someone. And it's on sale. I wouldn't be able to find it that cheaply anywhere else. So I better buy it because otherwise I will miss that opportunity. And so she buys it, she puts it in the bag, it goes here, and here's where it stays for more than a decade. Now this is not her house. This is a different house. But one of the things I wanted to point out here is for about half of the cases that we see, the stuff spills out into the outside of the house. The, uh, about half the cases, the stuff is all contained within the house itself. But for uh, about half the cases, it spills to the outside. These are the cases that are most likely to get identified by neighbors and the health department because it's observable to everybody else. But you see here the complication. All this stuff forms a bramble with weeds and, and uh, all kinds of things and rodents and so forth. And that's the, that's the problem many health departments have with this kind of behavior. Uh, the other thing you see here, and you can't quite see it on this slide, so it got a little too dark here, is there is deterioration on the outside of the house. And that deterioration, the clapboards are coming off, so you're seeing the underboards there. Uh, there is a lot of overgrown foliage. That's very characteristic in these cases. And if, you, if you've read stuff, there's a, a story in stuff of uh, a, a hoarding tour of Berkeley that I took with some people in the, from the Berkeley area who actually had uh, hoarding problems themselves and claimed that uh, they knew lots of people in Berkeley who did. And in fact, they identified about a person on every block with a significant hoarding problem, and a lot of it from looking at the outside of the house. The other thing that we see in hoarding cases is whatever container the person has access to gets filled. So automobiles, trucks, and so forth. Sometimes we see uh, automobiles that cannot be used because they're absolutely packed with stuff. Just uh, a month or so ago, there was a woman in Boston who was arrested because she, as she was driving along, all the stuff beside her in the passenger seat came, came cascading down onto the accelerator and caused an accident. So whatever facility is available to people, they fill up. Irene, for instance, had, had a car that was absolutely packed. And now Irene had a wide circle of friends. Very few of them knew about this problem. And one of the things she would do when she would be going out with her friends is she would always go early. She would park at the end of the parking lot so no one could see her as she was walking to and from her car. And she developed a set of ready-made excuses why she couldn't give anybody a ride at any time, because then they would see her car. Okay? So that kind of experience is quite common in people with hoarding problems. All right. 
So now let's take a look at what we've got here. We've got three different behaviors here. We've got the acquisition, all, that, all those gifts and things. Okay, That's a piece of this that we need to explain. We've got the saving behavior, this, this decision on, on her part to save all this stuff. And we've got this disorganization. So it's more than simply the volume of stuff that's coming in and staying. It's how that stuff is organized or not organized that's central here that, uh, to this whole process. So these are the three ma basic manifestations of hoarding that we have to understand in order to come up with some way of dealing with it. All right, so let's start with acquisition. There are really four types of acquisition that we see. Um, buying, picking up free things, stealing in some cases, and more passive acquisition. So for instance, if you never threw out all those letters that come from city cards about getting a, a credit card, how long would it take for your house to fill up? Um, so there are some people, and we'll talk a little bit about this in just a second, but there are some folks, not very many, but some folks with hoarding problems who just have that passive form of acquisition. The buying form of acquisition is a compulsion to buy. Now, let me give you a, a, an example that will give you a sense of what that's like for Irene. Irene cannot go to New York City because if she goes to New York City, invariably she sees a newsstand on the street. And she thinks to herself, look at all those newspapers and all those magazines. Somewhere in all of that, there's a piece of information that could change my life. How can I walk away without it? And the only way she can tolerate it is to cross to the other side of the street and look away. Now, that's a big clue. What is that? What is that? For those of you who are anxiety disorder specialists, that is avoidance behavior. Okay? Anytime we see someone engaging in avoidance behavior, any kind of behavior to avoid an emotional experience, they are setting themselves up for the development of a disorder. Okay? And that's what we see here, that kind of avoidance behavior. Now, that's one example of buying. We have another case that, that was sort of equally dramatic, a woman who was addicted to um, um, TV shopping, you know, where you, you're watching TV and you bid on things. Shopping channel. <clears throat> Thank you. So she's sitting there one day. <laughs> we know who's addicted around here, right? <laughs> uh, this, this person was, was uh, watching the shopping channel one day, and she sees a puppet come up, a little wooden puppet. And she's thinking to herself, I, you know, I'm not interested in a puppet. I don't want a puppet. But they're trying to sell this puppet on TV, and they're, they're waiting for people to, to bid on the puppet. And she's sitting there and watching, and no one bids on the puppet. And she's watching, and no one bids on the puppet. And no one bids on the puppet. And she thinks to herself, that poor puppet. And she ends up buying it, because she doesn't want it to feel bad. Now, evidently, the people at the TV station understand these things, because they put another one up. And she bought it. She bought a half a dozen of these things and didn't want them. But the thought captured her, this thought about this object, about the, the, the feelings that this object may have. Okay, So it tells us a couple of things about the nature of this phenomena and a couple of things about people's ability to control their buying okay? and what it means for their lives. For Irene, Irene lived for tag sales, garage sales, every Saturday morning. She would be out at a garage sale. It's, it gave her juice. That's what she lived for. Free things are another feature that is, that is very highly uh, 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 frequent in, in hoarding problems. And Irene collected free things as well. She had an arrangement with her local postmaster. 
any newspaper or magazine that couldn't be delivered because the address was smudged. On Saturday morning, the postmaster would collect all that stuff, would put it in the foyer, and she would come by on her way to the tag sales and pick it up and bring it home. Okay. We see a lot of this kind of behavior. Uh, in addition to picking up free things like that, we see a lot of dumpster diving as well, people going into uh, uh, and rummaging through other people's trash to pick up stuff. We also see, in about 10% of the cases, some stealing behavior, but that, again, that's relatively uncommon. But it is more frequent than in the general population. <clears throat> All right, so the second manifestation is in the, this compulsive saving. Now, we can think about this in two ways. Either the person is compulsively saving something, or they're simply unable to let it go. And it's probably worth thinking about this in both ways until we come, a, come to a clear understanding of what this is about. The most frequently saved items by people who hoard are clothes, newspapers and books, and containers. Those are the four most frequent things. Now, typically, what is saved is pretty much everything. Now, uh, as a precursor, we're going we're to talk about diagnosis. In the current version of the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, hoarding shows up as one criteria for obsessive compulsive personality disorder. All that's going to change. But when it showed up there, it was described as the inability to throw out worthless and worn out things. But that was a, painted a very incorrect picture of hoarding problems. Because, yeah, people who hoard do save worthless and worn out things, but really they save everything. They save things that have value. They collect many more things of value than the rest of us. <coughs> and basically, they can't throw anything away. They save everything. We've had cases where, where people have a house filled with stuff that's all new, never out of the box, clothes with the tags never taken off. So it's not a disorder of, well, of being unable to let go of worthless and worn out things. It's a disorder where people collect, collect and keep anything that comes into their possession. So another important thing to keep in mind when we talk about this. <clears throat> in our first study of hoarding, one of the things we were interested in is the nature of these attachments that people have to their things. And we wanted to know how these attachments differ for people who have a hoarding problem versus people who don't. And so we asked a series of questions about why they save things. And what we discovered is that people who hoard save things for exactly the same reasons that you and I save things. And those things fall into three basic categories. Sentimental saving, we save things because these objects have an emotional impact for us. When you think about it, and this isn't the topic for today, but, but, but I want you to just think about this. Our possessions have a magical quality. We all keep things that have meaning that goes well beyond the physical characteristics of the object. That ticket stub to a favorite concert, there's nothing about the physical qualities of that ticket stub. It's the emotional meaning that you attach to it because of the memories of that event. And that is magic. That's not logic, that's magic. And that's what, what, uh, what all of us do. Uh, instrumental saving refers to saving things that we need. You need your driver's license, you need your passport, you wouldn't throw those things away because you have need for them. Intrinsic saving has to do with uh, saving things simply because you like them. A picture on the wall that doesn't have any emotional significance or any great financial value, you just like it. Okay? Uh, those are the three basic reasons people give for the things they save. Now the difference between people who hoard and people who don't is in the frequency which, with which these kinds of attachments form and the intensity with which they form. As an example, when I was working with Irene one day in her TV room with all those papers, we had the scheme developed where there was a box that, that was for things that she was going to recycle and a box for those papers she was going to save. And, and one day she picked up an ATM envelope. You know the envelope you get from an ATM machine that has cash in it? <clears throat> she picked up an ATM envelope that was empty. It was uh, from five years ago. And she had written on the back how she spent the money. And it wasn't anything all that significant, uh, drugstore items, grocery store items, a few other things. She put it in the recycle box, and she started to cry. 
And she said, it feels like I'm losing that day in my life. And if I throw too much away, there'll be nothing left of me. So this object carried with it the memories for that day. Very common phenomena in hoarding. And what, uh, uh, another way of thinking about this, the way I think about it is, is like this. You, you, know, uh, you know what happens to you when you hear a song from your childhood? Remember that experience? It's not just that you remember your childhood. It's that you're suddenly back there and you have this visceral feeling of what it was like back then. Okay? I think that's what's happening to Irene when she sees this. And it's, it, rather than, the, for the rest of us, this is a, you know, a musical kind of thing, but for her, it's the visual uh, sight of this object that brings back that personal history in a very visceral and vibrant way. And that's quite common. Now, what, what we do in treatment to deal with this is we ask people, we don't, we don't say, well, you've got to throw it away and forget about it. We say, why don't we do an experiment? Why don't we leave it in this box and see what happens to you? Okay? And so she, she did that. And about 10 minutes later, I said, when the thing, now this is interesting, when the thing was out of sight, when there was other stuff on top of it, okay? I said, how do you feel about that now? And she said, well, you know, that wasn't such a good day. And it was okay after that. All right? So what does that tell us about this phenomenon? It tells us that, because what, what she said is, if you weren't here, I wouldn't leave it in that box. So what happened to her is each time she picks up this envelope and has this experience, and she begins to experience this, this horrible feeling that she's losing a piece of her personal history, what does she do? She saves it in order to avoid that feeling. Again, we're seeing this avoidance behavior. And the other thing that we learn and that she learns is that when she does not avoid this feeling, the feeling goes away. And that is critical for these folks in trying to change because we can't, I can't as a therapist, uh, uh, I can't tell her that she has to just forget about it. I can't tell her to change the way she's thinking about these things because she wouldn't believe me and she wouldn't do it. She has to be the one to experience this and change these beliefs on her own, and change these behaviors on her own. And that's what we do in these experiments. We get her to experiment with things like that and she discovers this phenomenon. Come back to that in a little while. So, so that gives you a sense of what the, what the sentimental uh, attachment is like. Now the instrumental attachment that we see, you know the the space between your refrigerator and the cupboard around it in the kitchen. Hers is filled with the cardboard tubes from the inside of toilet paper rolls. And what she said was, these would make great art projects. And I'm saving them for my son's art teacher. Well, it turns out she'd never even met her son's art teacher. She didn't know him. She had no idea whether he would want these things or not. But the thought, she had the thought, and here's another clue, this thought, this is, this, these objects have a potential use, and throwing them away would be wasting them. Now, I, I want you to think about this in a little bit different way, and you may, you may be surprised by what I'm saying, but I think more of us should think this way, right? We throw things away. We shouldn't be throwing away. We put things in the landfill that have use, uses for other people. So I, I don't want you to come away thinking that what these people are experiencing is necessarily a disorder, okay? That there's something else there. It may be a disorder, but there's also something else there and something we should all maybe value a little bit, okay? But we, we have to understand it all in context, however. <clears throat> and something else, intrinsic saving. I showed up at Irene's house one day, <clears throat> and her eyes lit up. And she said, I've got to show you something. I just found it the other day. She ran into the other room, and she came back 
with a large, clear plastic bag filled with bottle caps. And she said, look at these bottle caps. Aren't they beautiful? Look at the shape and the color. And at that moment, I knew I should never have dropped art appreciation in high school. <laughs> because for me, when I see a bottle cap without a bottle, the only thought I have is trash. I have no other, nothing else in my head other than how do I get rid of this thing. But for her, these things are rich with meaning. There are lots of thoughts that she has about them. So if she's going to try to throw things away, these bottle caps, she's got to sort through all these thoughts she has about them. If I'm going to throw away a bottle cap, I don't have any sorting to do at all, because I don't have any thoughts about it. Okay? Now, as a result of seeing this, I, I initially thought that maybe, maybe people with hoarding problems are simply smarter than I am. And that may be true. They clearly have more creativity than I do because the f there's a focus on the unique qualities of objects and appreciation of the physical world that I have come to neglect. Now maybe I've come to neglect it because that helps me behave more efficiently and effectively. And maybe for her, she simply has not been able to do that. Right? Now, come back to that uh, again uh, later on. The third feature here is this disorganization. Now, verse two, acquisition and, and difficulty throwing things away, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter, does it, how much stuff any of us have, as long as it doesn't get in our way. So for Irene, yeah, her house was pretty full, but if she had it arranged differently, maybe it would be perfectly functional, okay? It, the, the, the feature that may be the critical feature for hoarding is this disorganization. And there are two kinds of disorganization that we see. The first is the clutter that's going on here. Okay? That clutter is very disorganized. Now, <clears throat> what happens when a health department comes in and sees this? Not so much anymore, but early on in the history of hoarding, what happened is when housing folks and when health department folks come in, and they see this, <clears throat> this appears to be all trash. So they bring in shovels and they scoop it all up and throw it out. But what we what come to find out, in here, in this pile, is the title to the car, the diamond ring that she lost a couple of months ago. It's a mixture of important and unimportant things. And that's because, as Irene says, Everything is compelling. Bottle caps are as compelling as the title to the car. And so they, she saves it all, and she saves it in this kind of, uh, in this kind of context. And we'll talk about the nature of this, of this uh, disorganization in a few minutes. <clears throat> um, the the, the um, issue of the mixture of important and unimportant things really was driven home one day for me when we're, we're, getting a, we're doing pretty well in treatment. Okay, and, and she's getting better. And I arrive one day and she says, okay, today I think I can throw away a whole New York Times without looking at it. Just let me pick it up and shake it. So she picked it up and she shook it and out fell an ATM envelope with $100 in cash. Not a great therapeutic moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and afterwards I was thinking, did she plant it there? <clears throat> I don't think she really did, but it, it points out that this mixture of important and unimportant things is critical to understanding this phenomena and what you do about it, because that complicates any attempt to get rid of all this stuff and to clean out the house, because you've got to go through it piece by piece. Or you're going to throw out things that are valuable. The other kind of disorganization we see is disorganization of behavior. <clears throat> and this churning behavior that we saw of her, in fact, this became, it, we see it so consistently with her picking things up, looking at them, putting them down, and basically after three hours, the pile is churned, but nothing is thrown away. This is very disorganized, inefficient kind of behavior, inefficient problem solving. 
Uh, and that's very characteristic of this disorganized behavior. The other feature of this behavior, and, and, and it has to do with putting things out of sight. Remember what she did with each of these things? She put it on top of the pile so she could see it. I didn't show you her bedroom. It looked much like the rest of the house. On top of her dresser, or her clothes were piled all the way to the ceiling. But her dresser drawers were empty. And what she said was, if I put my clothes in the drawer, I won't be able to see them. And if I can't see them, they'll be lost to me. Okay? So the sight of, of the possessions, this visual processing is really very central to this disorder. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But you can see this pattern forming of this visual kind of processing. It's very different. Okay, now there's some other core features, and we'll, we'll, we'll put them together when we get to the model. One is indecisiveness. People with this problem tend to have great difficulty making decisions, and decisions about anything. What to order off a menu at a restaurant, what clothes to put on in the morning. Any kind of decision takes a long time. Uh, and think a, a little bit about what we know already about hoarding. We, people with this problem have all this information, they're processing much more information than me about, for instance, these bottle caps. So for her to make a decision to throw out these bottle caps means that she's got to wade through a whole bunch of information. And, and that's not information that I uh, am pr uh, uh, privy to. So when I look at a bottle cap, I don't have to fil filter through all that information because none of that is relevant to me. Uh, the second feature here, this is really interesting. You would think, looking at the homes of people with this problem, that, that they're simply messy somehow, and they're not very concerned about, about things. But what we find is that people with hoarding problems are pretty highly perfectionistic. They're very concerned about making mistakes. Uh, they're very concerned about doing things in a perfect way. One of the people in, um, in the book stuff named Nell is a woman who is in her mid-70s. She lives in a home that's absolutely packed. You'll see a few pictures. Uh, do we have, uh, I don't remember whether those pictures are in here or not. But she lives in a, room, a house that's really packed. Her kitchen is absolutely full and sort of borderline squalid. And yet she still works. She makes her living cleaning people's houses. But she can't clean her own kitchen because she says, I can't get it clean enough to suit me. So I just don't try. And she learns to live with it the way it is. Okay, So a very odd kind of, we see this a lot in perfectionism, where people are so concerned about not doing it perfectly, they don't do it at all. Uh, a lot of procrastination. And if any of you have, have dealt with these hoarding cases where you, you sort of go based on a promise, well, I'll do this next week. You know procrastination is a, is a, a characteristic that we see in these cases. And a, another characteristic you probably noticed is so, what psychologists call central coherence. Uh, basically, what this means is an inability to see the forest for the trees. There's so much focus on detail that it's hard to abstract a general overview understanding of an issue. And we see a lot of that in hoarding behavior. OK, so epidemiologically, what we find is there are four basic epidemiological studies. And what they found is the frequency of clinically significant hoarding ranges from about 2% studied in the UK up to almost 6%, a study in Germany. This makes it two to three times more frequent than disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder. This means that in the United States alone, there may be as many as 15 or 16 million people who suffer from this problem. So this is much more frequent than we ever imagined when we started out looking at this. <clears throat> and as you probably, or if you've ever done any speaking and been at places where people report these things, virtually everyone in the audience knows someone or has a relative or perhaps has this problem themselves. So it's really quite frequent. The, the prevalence, at least what we know, and again, a, a lot of the research that I'm going to talk about is, yeah, it's what we know so far, 
But we have to remain a bit skeptical about it because all the research is so new. And the definition of hoarding and how we, how we identify it, how we measure severity, has only become clear in the last couple of years. So a lot of these studies, and particularly these epidemiological studies, are based on somewhat earlier notions of, of, of hoarding, although they're, they're still close to what we understand now. But one of the things that was found in the Samuels et al. Et al study is that there is an association with income, that uh, we see a lot higher frequency of hoarding in lower income folks, a lot uh, a lower frequency of hoarding in high income folks, um, but it's not absent. So as you'll know, if you've read Stuff, a number of the people in Stuff are people who grew up in the lap of luxury and, um, and they still have, uh, end up with hoarding problems. There is a, an age relationship here. Now, interestingly, we'll talk in a minute about onset, but onset starts pretty early in life. But, the, but most of the time, the cases that we see that, that come in with clinically significant hoarding tend to be older. And you can see that, that among people 55 to 94 in this, uh, this is the Samuel study also, the rate of hoarding was about 6.2%, about 3% for people ages 45 to 54, and 2.3% for people ages 34 to 44. So there, is, uh, there does appear to be a relationship with age, and we see more hoarding in older folks. Now, in part, it, this may be not that the behavior's gotten more severe, but things have happened to these folks. And one of the things that happens that kind of exaggerates hoarding quickly is when someone in their 50s or early 60s has parents who die and leave them all their stuff. And all that stuff comes in, it's all sentimental, and it simply compounds the problem. And not, that, not that these folks did not have a hoarding problem before, it's just that it maybe it wasn't terribly severe to that point. The other thing that we see in hoarding behavior is a, a much higher frequency of people who have never married or people who have married and gotten divorced. Now, this may be cause or it may be effect. It might be that they never marry because who would want to marry into a home that, like that? They may get divorced more often because who, like Irene's husband, who didn't want to stay in that environment. Um, but either way, if the isolation sort of leads them to hoarding or if the hoarding leads them to more isolation, what we do see in this population is a great deal of isolation. And this is a critical thing to understand because the more isolated they are, the worse the problem gets. And, and we'll come back to that later on. We talk about intervention, but it's a key variable here. If you've got someone with a hoarding problem and they're all alone, their family is no longer in contact with them. Nobody comes to their house and so forth. You're going to see a hoarding problem that's worse, and it's going to be harder to get rid of. <clears throat> we do see hoarding in children, um, and we, we see it all the way down. We have a couple we have reports and stuff of uh, kids as young as four engaging in hoarding behaviors, and it looks a little bit different. We see a uh, a very close overlap with ADHD and other sort of developmental disability issues. Um, <clears throat> we see this, <clears throat> we see the ADHD in adults as well as we'll talk about, but with kids it's really dramatic. <clears throat> what we often see that, that leads to the identification of this, because uh, you know, a, a lot of you I'm sure have, have kids, and you know kids save things. <clears throat> My kids used to save the boxes things came in, and, and would you know, object to having us throw them away. Uh, and that's all pretty natural and normal. And so you wonder, well, how can you tell what's, what's normal, what's abnormal? Well, the parents that, we, that we've interviewed of kids who have significant hoarding problems say, I can really tell this difference. This is not normal. And the thing that isn't normal is the reaction to touching or moving objects. When the parents touch, move, or throw away those objects, the emotional reaction on the part of the kids is really very intense, much more intense than we would normally see uh, among kids. These kids have very little insight into why they're so attached to these things, which is quite interesting. There's an abnormal level of personification. <clears throat> now, all kids personify things. Things have human-like qualities. But what we see in hoarding with these kids is a very abnormal level of personification. <clears throat> so. Um, one of the kids that, uh, whose parents we interviewed for, uh, for the book, um, four-year-old, is a summer day, he's outside, and it's very hot, and he's got Kool-Aid, a glass of Kool-Aid, and he spills the Kool-Aid 
on the driveway. And he gets very upset because he's afraid the Kool-Aid is hurt. We had another case, and this was an adult, who, f who was concerned about the feelings of the dishes in the dishwasher when she put them on the lower rack because the dirty dishes on the upper rack, upper rack were dripping down on them. Okay? So you see this kind of funny anthropomorphism. It's, it's common in children, but yet when we see it in, in children who hoard, it's exaggerated. And in adults, we see it's, it's almost as though they never outgrew that kind of personification. The other thing that we see is a heightened level of essentialism. Now, what I mean by essentialism, it comes back to this magic associated with possessions. Essentialism refers to the extent to which an object has value that goes beyond its physical characteristics. <clears throat> um, a, a good example, I tell this in, in stuff, it's a, I, I teach a class, a, a seminar on hoarding at Smith. And one day in, in the class, I asked the students if any of them had a special object that they had a special attachment to, that had special meaning for them. And one of the students sheepishly raised her hand and said yes, that she on eBay had bought a shirt that was once worn by Jerry Seinfeld. Now, if you're Jerry Seinfeld's fans, it wasn't the puffy shirt. <laughs> uh, but it, it was a shirt that was worn by Jerry Seinfeld. And I said, well, what is so special about it? And she said, well, because it was worn by Jerry Seinfeld. And I said, OK, well, what if, what if you didn't know that it was worn by Jerry Seinfeld? Would it still have the same meaning? And she said, no. And I said, well, you know, the shirt obviously has been laundered, so there's nothing, no DNA or anything of Jerry Seinfeld that's in the shirt. How, what is it, that, why, it that, why does it have this meaning for you? Because, the, uh, she said, because it connects me to Jerry Seinfeld. It connects me to Jerry Seinfeld. And, this, and what I thought at the time was, this is, this is what Irene is doing with all her stuff. Because she's always talking, she's always talking about how these things connect her to the world. And this is her connection. So it's essentialism refers to the extent to which an object has meaning that goes beyond its physical characteristics. And we see a lot of that in hoarding behavior. We also see a lot of that for all of us. Because all of us, again, as I said, uh, our possessions are magic. <clears throat> Another place where we see a lot of hoarding behavior is in elderly. Um, the, one of the estimates uh, is that about 15% of nursing home residents engage in hoarding behavior, hoarding related behaviors. It's a problem for people who work in these um, institutions. 25% uh, uh, of community daycare elders participate in hoarding small items from one of our studies. Uh, the rate of, of hoarding among elders in private and public housing is pretty high. In the Elders at Risk program in Boston, they estimate approximately 15%. Visiting Nurses Association, 10 to 15% of their clients. And the Community Guardianship Programs in New York City, that's not NC, that's New York City, between 30 and 35% of their cases are hoarding cases. Now, the, and what happens with these hoarding cases, they actually go to court and get a guardian appointed. And now the guardian is responsible for all this stuff. So it's a, it's a real tough issue for the, the person who's the guardian because now they're responsible for this other person's stuff. <clears throat> so, what, the other things that we see here, the kinds of consequences, I'll run through these quickly because I'm sure you're all aware of them, is a lack of sanitation. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent of hoarding cases really live in conditions that are terribly unsanitary and squalid. This is the kitchen of an 80-something-year-old former head nurse of a major hospital. And you can imagine what her life is like trying to live with a kitchen that looks like this. Uh, this is the, the home of a 50-something-year-old man. This is a stairway. Now, as this guy gets older, you can imagine how much trouble he's going to have here and how much this poses a threat to his safety. <clears throat> this is the home of a, one of the people in one of our studies where the exits are blocked. If the person, this is a 60-something-year-old woman. If the person's standing here and there's a fire, there's no way she could get out because of this. Okay. <clears throat> 
there's a, a community cost for these cases are pretty high. In, in um, early, uh, uh, in 2000, we did a, a study of health departments and their experience with hoarding. And what we found was that among health departments in the state of Massachusetts, when they had a hoarding case, 80% of the time, the case involved activity of multiple agencies. So when a hoarding case comes up, there are multiple agencies involved. And back then, in 2000, there weren't very many coalitions or task forces. So each of these agencies are working independently on the case. So in one case, you've got the health department working on it over here. You've got the elder service agency working on it over here. You've got a housing agency working on it over here. And none of them, sometimes they don't even know about each other doing this. So, so this is a real uh, wake-up call, I think, for figuring out how to deal with this in a, in a different way. Uh, housing issues. Uh, in, in a recent study we did of a large number of hoarding cases, 8 to 12 percent of them have been evicted or threatened with eviction. The cost for housing, and I'm sure since you're all housing folks, you know how much these things cost. In one case in, in uh, Hampshire County, it, where Northampton is, in one year, the Tenancy Preservation Program spent $6,000 on this case. The property management company that was managing this individual's apartment spent $50,000 on this case. And that's only one year's worth. And at the end of the year, the problem was still there. So it can be enormously expensive. Now, I, I do have um, um, some, some slides related to fire risk, but I think I'll hold those off until the, um, until the panel this afternoon and start off with that, because I've, I've got a lot of other stuff to cover here. So. I'll hold off, but, but I, I did a visit uh, at, at the request of the Melbourne Fire Brigade in, um, in Australia, and, and they have been collecting a lot of data on hoarding and the impact on firefighting there. So I'll talk about that uh, this afternoon. Uh, there's a recent study um, out of London on homelessness and hoarding. And what they found in their, in their survey of a homeless population is that 17% of the, their homeless population they identified reported significant hoarding problems. And that 8% of them, that is nearly 10% of the homeless people in London became homeless because of their hoarding problem. So a, a very kind of ironic thing, isn't it? Someone who has such an affinity for so much stuff ends up without anything. And we do see here a, a frequent occurrence where someone who loses their housing, they have a little bit of income, they will spend that income on a rental storage unit to keep their stuff, and they'll live on the street. Okay, so a very funny kind of relationship here with things. Um, we know that this has a major impact on families, and in particular on children and people with hoarding problems. And these problems, these effects, seem to be worst when the child grows up in a hoarded home and lives there before the age of 10. If the, someone lives in a hoarded home before the age of 10, what we see later on in life is their report of a very unhappy childhood, a, a fear of having people over to their house, even when they are adults, even though they don't have a hoarding problem. When the doorbell rings, they experience doorbell dread, which is what happened when they were kids. And, and that carries with them for a lifetime. They are in, uh, frequently f felt embarrassed about their home when they were young. They feel embarrassed about their parents now. As they're adults and they're aging, their parents are aging, uh, this, there's this very strained relationship. Oftentimes, what happens is the person with the, with the hoarding problem becomes totally separated from their parents. I mean, from their, from their families. And their families no longer have any contact with them. And the pattern is frequently pretty much the same, where the adult children of someone with a hoarding problem want to help. And that help takes the form of, in the, in the view of the person with the hoarding problem, invading their space and throwing their stuff away. And that's when the relationship breaks down. Uh, and so we see a greater level of rejection in adulthood by, by the children of of uh, parents who hoard. Uh, and it's a particular problem. So there's a population of people who 
who grew up in this environment who have other struggles related to this that are, that are really sequelae or after effects of this hoarding problem. Uh, we see a lot of conflict. And in, in our study, what we found was that there's a lot of conflict with spouses more than siblings and friends. You can imagine if you're a spouse living in this environment, there's constant battling about this. Children more than siblings and friends. So siblings and friends, the conflict doesn't seem quite as, as severe. A great deal of isolation and a great deal of rejection by family and friends. And this is predicted by the hoarding severity. The more severe the hoarding, the more rejection on, on the part of family and friends, and the less insight on the part of the, the person with the hoarding problem, the more rejection is experienced. <clears throat> um, now, we don't know that whether or not there are different types of hoarding except for one case, and that is the case of people who hoard animals. And he, this, is a, this is related to hoarding disorder, hoarding of objects, but it's a bit more extreme, uh, primarily because what they are saving, what they are keeping, are uh, live um, uh, creatures. What we do know about animal hoarding is it is mostly female, most of these folks are in their mid-50s. Most are single. They're very socially isolated. So their beliefs about, their, their beliefs about, about uh, animals aren't really so influenced by other people because they don't really interact with other people about them. Mainly what we see are cats and dogs, but we do see cases of uh, people saving large numbers of horses and uh, uh, sometimes other animals like um, um, birds, snakes, beavers, uh, all kinds of stuff. Keeping them in the home, uh, it is a remarkable what we, you know, the variety of things. Usually there are 30 to 40 animals, <clears throat> um, sometimes more in the book, in stuff. We have a whole chapter on animal hoarding, and it is about a woman. She, at the time I interviewed her, she was in her 70s, but at, from about age 30 to age 50, she collected and saved animals, about 200 at, at the maximum. But that paled in comparison to her psychiatrist, who had 700 animals, and created basically a cat hoarding cult in New York City, and got her patients to, do, to be a part of it. So she had a, a dozen patients, all of whom were saving cats. They were saving the cats from the streets of New York. And at one point, a half a dozen of her patients all moved to the same block in Brooklyn. Can you imagine living on that block? <laughs> uh, what, from, from the findings of some of the studies we've done, what, what we know about animal hoarding is that these folks develop an early and very strong association with animals. They tend to be very shy and socially awkward people, and they experience very chaotic parenting. One of the people in this sample uh, uh, that, that we looked at, it's a woman I interviewed who described, this is uh, a, 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 a woman who saved all kinds of animals, uh, and she described this odd childhood where she had a sister, uh, and every Saturday night, her parents would load the family up, sisters in the back seat, and drive to the local bar. The sisters would stay in the car, the parents would go into the bar and spend the evening there and come out at the end of the evening, each with a, di with a different partner, and they would all go home. And this is the kind of, the kind of chaoticness that you see in these cases. Sometimes it's, it's, there's physical abuse involved, but I'll, most of it is just this sort of chaos of a, of a life that's really sort of out of the ordinary in terms of discipline and what happens in the home. There's also a tolerance for poor hygiene. So people who, who experience animal hoarding kind of learn to live like animals and, and they, 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 they sort of let animals take over. It's, it's as though animals are treated like humans. And so if, if my cats are just like me, they should have the same rights that I do. So they can decide where they want to go to the bathroom and when they want to eat. So I don't have to do it because they're, you know, they're adults. Um, 
we see a lot of, of more delusional-like behavior. In some ways, this may be a, a, a bit more like a delusional disorder. Uh, and and what, we, what we see in these delusional beliefs are, are the ascribing of human qualities to animals. This is what I was just referring to. You know, these animals, can, they're like adults. They should be treated like people. You know, all of us treat our pets like people, right? But yet, we take responsibility for them. We, we make sure they go out, they go to the bathroom. We make sure they have food and water and so forth. So in some ways, we don't treat them like people. We treat them maybe like children. But here, they're being treated differently. They also tend to believe, these folks, that they have special abilities in relating to animals. So um, Pamela, the person in stuff, believed that she was psychic and that she had a psychic connection to animals. And whenever she saw a cat in New York City, she communicated with the cat. And the cat told her, I need help. So she collected it and brought it home. And met, now, many of them died because of the way she ended up treating them. But her, in her mind, she was saving the cats from the streets of New York. And that was her mission in life, was to save these cats. Um, these folks tend to be more closely attached to animals than people. And that's part of the difficulty that, that, uh, that people face. Now, these folks are much harder to deal with, much harder to treat. Because what happens when they get identified? Their face, their home, their animals are on TV. And everyone around them is excoriating them for being such horrible people. So if you're in that boat, would you talk to somebody about it? That's part of the problem. Now, we have talked to a number of these folks well after these incidents happen. And we do see people who come through this on the other side. And they can look back and say, you know, that was really craziness. The woman, Pamela, and stuff. Uh, when I interviewed her, it was about 20 years after she'd stopped saving animals. And she said, you know, looking back, I realized that I was way out there, that this was really crazy, that I was, that I was doing the very thing I was trying to prevent. So she could see it, but she was not in the middle of it anymore. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, diagnosis um, of hoarding. Um, in hoarding, in, in the dsm 4 as it exists now, Hoarding only shows up, as I said, as a criteria for obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And for those of you who are disorder aficionados, that's different. It's an axis two disorder. It's one of the personality disorders. It's not like a major mental disorder. Um, and again, this worthless and worn out description does not match the phenomenology. So it's really very uh, sort of incorrect. And, in fact, the, in the new version of DSM-5, the people who are putting together the personality disorder section have recognized this, and they're removing it from the criteria for obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, now, in DSM-4, the OCD connection is mentioned in this section on personality disorders. And it says that OCD should be considered when the hoarding is extreme. And when criteria for both are met, both should be recorded, that is OCPD and OCD. Now this is very confusing for a clinician. If you're a clinician trying to make a diagnosis, well, how do you know when to say it's OCD and not? I mean, if it's serious enough to be a criterion, isn't it, isn't it severe enough to be a disorder? So this is part of the reason why uh, this is being taken out of here and um, <clears throat> why it, I'll talk a second about what's going to happen with respect to OCD as well. Um, Hoarding is not mentioned in any earlier versions of the DSM. Now, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, is used in this country and several others. There is another system, the International Classification of Diseases, that is used in, in some other countries. And it's called, referred to as ICD-10, the 10th version of ICD. And hoarding is not mentioned in the 10th version of ICD. So at the moment, this is all that exists with respect to diagnosis of hoarding. However, when we start looking at hoarding behavior, what we find is that when we look at uh, mo most of researchers up until about five or six years ago thought of hoarding as a subtype of OCD because that's where it showed up most often. So 25 to 30 percent of people with OCD experience had hoarding as one of their symptoms. But only 5 percent had hoarding that in and of itself was clinically significant. 
So there's a great deal of overlap with OCD, and that's why it was initially thought to be a subtype of OCD. But what we know now is if we take, if we look at it from a different angle, if we look at people who have hoarding problems, who would we, we would define as having hoarding disorder based on, on our definition, and then we look at the frequency with which those people also have OCD, as Irene did, we find that only 18% of this sample of people also have OCD. So the overlap between hoarding and OCD is much smaller. And the other thing, if you remember the, the prevalence data, how could hoarding be a subtype of OCD if it happens two to three times more frequently? Okay, so th there's starting to be this picture of that, that hoarding is different, and, and, and so it needs to be its own disorder. And that's because it's highly prevalent, much more prevalent than OCD, so it doesn't really match. There is significant distress or impairment experienced in hoarding. The current categories leave out the majority of people who suffer from hoarding disorder. And so if, we do, if it doesn't overlap with OCPD, doesn't overlap with OCD, what do we do with it? Well, one option is to leave it out altogether. Now, that means that all these people that you see would not get a diagnosis. They would not qualify for any kind of psychological treatment. But that's not, that's not a very wise choice, given what we know about how serious this problem is and how difficult it is to treat. And in fact, when we look at this, it fits the definition of mental disorder that is the basis for uh, putting together DSM-5. Uh, and finally, the advantages of creating a new disorder outweigh the potential harms. And the major potential harm here is that we're pathologizing normal behavior. We're pathologizing messiness. But we, we think that by, by applying the proper criteria, we can eliminate people who are simply messy and, and rather define the disorder in a, in a clear way. Now, just as an aside, uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons why hoarding is no longer considered a subtype of OCD is, for those of you who know OCD, OCD is a disorder that begins with an intrusive thought. And an evaluation of that intrusive thought as threatening, dangerous, and distressing. So the thought might be that I got germs on my hand from touching this table, and I might contaminate myself. I might contaminate Anita simply by standing near her, and that would be intolerable. So now my compulsion is to wash my hands, and I start washing my hands. And then I think, well, maybe I didn't get all the germs off. Maybe I missed a spot, so I wash again. May I'm not sure I got it all off. It doesn't feel quite right, so I wash again, and so forth. So that's OCD. It's an intrusive thought, and the f everything that follows from that intrusive thought is part of the disorder. So the disorder begins with an intrusive thought that's experienced as distressing. In hoarding, that doesn't happen. In hoarding, frequently, it starts with a pleasant experience with Irene picking up her box of newspapers and magazines from the, from the uh, postmaster. That's not a distressing thought, okay? That's a pleasant experience, a positive experience. So hoarding, it, the phenomenology of hoarding doesn't match the phenomenology of OCD, and that's one of the reasons why it has been separated. Uh, so the, the, the way in which this new disorder came about is first of all, the DSM-5 uh, set up, the American Psychiatric Association set up the Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum Subwork Group. Uh, and uh, what happened was a number of us in this, in this article, a number of the hoarding researchers got together and wrote, uh, wrote this article proposing that the subcommittee consider inclusion of hoarding disorder as a separate diagnosis in DSM-5. And it was decided that it should be classified under the obsessive compulsive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. It's a big controversy here with DSM-5 because um, if, you know, if you know anything about it, uh, OCD was considered an anxiety disorder. And now it's being taken out of the anxiety disorder category and in, put into its own category. And a lot of people object to this. It seems kind of crazy because anxiety is central in OCD. And when I asked the, pe the people involved, they said, well, the two chapters are next to each other. 
And somehow that, that was an answer. I, I don't know why next to each other ma matters as opposed to being part of the chapter. But at any rate, it's a new, it's a new uh, sort of uh, grouping of disorders, OCD and related disorders. So there's OCD, there's hoarding, and, and one or two others. The basic uh, definition, uh, um, the basic criteria start with this definition that we started with of these three different features. Uh, and what's happened in DSM 11, or ICD-11, which is due out in 2015, has indicated that they will probably follow suit. So if hoarding disorders is included in DSM, then they will, um, they will follow suit. So the timeline started back in 1999, starting with research meetings, uh, research conferences, the work groups forming 2007, 2012. 2013, in May of 2013, this thing's designed to come out. And when it comes out, uh, hoarding is supposed to be a separate di disorder. Yeah, question. International classification of diseases. And then 2015 is when the ICD-11 comes out. So here are the criteria. And these are uh, 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 updated as of the end of April. So very recent. They've gone back up on the um, uh, DSM website. So, and it's open for public comment. So if you, wanna, if you have a comment about these things, you can make it. Uh, the first is a persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value. That last phrase was included to get away from this whole notion of things being worthless and worn out. Second, this difficulty discarding is due to perceived need to save items and distress associated with discarding them. That is to separate this from uh, disorders where people collect a bunch of things because they can't get rid of them. So for instance, if I have a contamination obsession about uh, cans of food, all right, used cans of food, I may, I may fill my house with these cans of food because I can't touch them to throw them out because I would be contaminated. So that would not qualify as, uh, as hoarding disorder because of this criteria. The symptoms result in accumulation possessions that congest and clutter active living areas. You can tell that this part was written by a committee. Uh, <laughs> that congested clutter activity li active living areas and substantially compromise their intended use. So this is basically out of this original um, diagnosis. If the living areas are uncluttered, it's only because of interventions of third parties, family members, cleaners, authorities. So it's possible for someone to get this diagnosis if they don't have any clutter. If the reason they don't have any clutter is because someone else has come in and cleaned them out or is having a substantial impact on keeping this place clean. Uh, the fourth, uh, hoarding causes clinically significant stress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, including maintaining a safe environment for self and others. These are the inclusion criteria. There are exclusion criteria that it's not attributable to another medical condition. There are some medical conditions. There are kinds of brain injury, uh, cerebrovascular disease, uh, certain other disorders like Prader-Willi syndrome is a syndrome, a genetic syndrome of uh, people, mostly kids, who can't, who, who do not have the capacity to experience satiety. So they keep eating and become very obese, but one of the other characteristics they display is, um, is hoarding behavior. Uh, and finally, the hoarding is not better accounted for by symptoms of another DSM-5 disorder like uh, hoarding due to obsessions, OCD, decreased energy, and major depressive disorder. And this one is an important one because we see a lot of depression. Delusions and schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders, uh, dementia, and autism. Because we see some of these behaviors in autism as well. All right, so there is a specifier with excessive acquisition. And we talked about acquisition. And, and what we talked about were the different forms of acquisition. So, we, we couldn't really include acquisition as one of the diagnostic criteria because we think there's somewhere between 10 and 20% of these folks who acquire things only passively. And so if we include excessive acquisition as a, as a diagnostic criteria, that would rule out those 10 or 20% who really should be included in the diagnosis. So it's used as a specifier. And what that means is that a clinician, when they're diagnosing this, has to indicate whether this person compulsively buys, collects free things, steals, and so forth because that, those are important things to know when we set up treatment for these folks. Uh, the second diagnostic specifier is insight, and there are three different levels. Good or fair insight, where the person recognizes that the hoarding-related beliefs and behaviors are problematic, 
who are inside when they're mostly convinced that these beliefs and behaviors are not problematic, despite evidence to the contrary, and uh, absent insight or delusional beliefs, where the person is completely convinced that the hoarding-related beliefs and behaviors are not problematic, despite evidence to the contrary. The criteria for animal hoarding. Yeah, question. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Indeed. And, and we'll, yes, I will come back to this because that's a, that's a great observation because that's exactly what I'm going to talk about when I talk about insight. Uh, and animal hoarding, uh, accumulation of large number of animals, no number is specified because it really has more to do with the care of the animals than the absolute number. Failure to provide an adequate living environment and reluctance to place animals for adoption or into the care of others. Now, here, here are some data, and I want to run through this quickly so we get to some other, other things um, related to the intervention. But there's some data that we've collected on comorbidity. And th these are, this is important because what it, what it tells us is that this is a large sample of 217 people with, who are very carefully diagnosed with hoarding. What we see is that over 50% of them have, meet criteria for major depressive disorder. So over half these people are clinically depressed. And the clinical depression is not causing the hoarding. So these things are comorbid. The, de the, the hoarding may be causing the depression, but it's not the other way around. So there's a great deal of comorbidity here. So whenever you see a hoarding case, you can expect that the person is going to have other kinds of disorders. In fact, in this sample, 90% of them had another disorder. Depression was the big one. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder was also high, well above 20%. Now, generalized anxiety disorder is a disorder characterized by worry, by worry. And so that's the main, the main tag there to think about when you think about this. Uh, uh, over 20% experienced social anxiety disorder. And only 18% of them, uh, this is the, these are the data I showed a few minutes ago, experienced OCD. So there are other disorders that are more frequent here. Than uh, an obsessive compulsive disorder. And when we look at impulse control disorders, and this certainly makes sense, uh, it, the I impulse control disorders have to do with those disorders where the person cannot stop themselves from engaging in some, some activity they find pleasurable. So in this case, uh, compulsive buying, and this is a comparison of people who hoard versus people who have OCD without hoarding. You can see the, the big difference here uh, for buying, for collecting free things, for kleptomania, okay, stealing behavior, only about. 9 or 10 percent experience this behavior, but it's significantly more than for OCD. But other impulse control disorders, not so much. Gambling, no difference. Uh, intermittent explosive disorder, um, no difference. This is a disorder like, this is where road rage would, would, be, would be classified. Um, <clears throat> ADHD, now we're going to come back and talk about ADHD when we talk about the model, but it, we see a big difference here. People, uh, nearly 30 percent of this sample of people with hoarding disorder experience clinically significant ADHD. This is, this is critical to our understanding of this phenomena. And over 15% experience the hyperactivity part of ADHD, not just the inattentive part. So let me run quickly through assessing hoarding behaviors. Um, we start in our, our process, and it's important to know, I think, what we do. You may not need to do this quite so uh, thoroughly, but we do an interview where we look at the, the home, we visit the home and evaluate the clutter. We look at the nature of the objects and their reactions to those objects. Uh, we, we try to figure out where to start. We try to help them uh, think about an organizational system. We, we evaluate what organizational system they have. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we look at acquiring, the reasons for saving, the, their interaction with family and friends. Because as you'll see, these are important components in any kind of intervention. Uh, whether their health or safety are impaired, and whether things need to be done right away because of that. Uh, other problems created by hoarding, what other things are happening in your life? Are there financial problems? Frequently these folks are unable to manage the payment of bills. What kinds of comorbidity do we see? What kind of family history? Uh, when, was, when did it start and what was the course? How did it follow along? And what kind of efforts has the person made at, it, at stopping? <clears throat> Um, there are a number of different measures. Uh, I won't spend much time. This is our hoarding rating scale. It's an interview that we use to, to um, uh, evaluate severity and diagnose it. 
Um, there, this is our clutter image rating. Um, here, we, we developed this because of a, I got a call one day from a local psychiatrist, and he said, look, I have the worst hoarding case you can imagine. And I think this person would be interested in being a, a participant in one of your research projects. He says he's interested in being a research project. He's evidently got a really severe hoarding problem. Um, that's why his wife left him because of the hoarding problem. That's why he's here in my office. And I said, okay. So we showed up at this guy's house, my student and myself. And we come in and I'm just amazed because his house is completely clean, except there's got one little pile of clutter on the dining room table and one in the corner of the dining room. And I'm thinking, wow, just, uh, just calling me and the guy cleaned up. I was feeling pretty good. And then I started talking to the guy. I said, well, you know, what happened? Well, you know, it looks like you've, you've done a good job of cleaning up. And he looked around and puzzled. He said, no, this is, my, this, is my, this is my clutter. My house is awful. Look at this. Look at how horrible this is. My wife left me because of this. And so the more we talked to them, the more we realized that wasn't why his wife left him. But he needed, he needed this explanation because he, could, he couldn't fathom why she wouldn't want to live with him. Um, so that got us thinking. You know, we got a problem here because if we're asking people, we're sitting in our office and we're asking people, yeah, how much clutter do you have? Well, this guy would have said his home is filled with clutter. So the definition people have for the word clutter it, it was getting in our way a little bit. So we decided we need to do something about it. And I posed this to my seminar. And I said, what can we do? And so we ended up renting an apartment. Now, there are some complications here because I'm a male professor at an all-women's college. And I'm renting an apartment with my class full of female students. <laughs> and when I told the provost about this, she, she looked askance at me. and. It took a little bit of convincing. Um, but we, we decided to fill the apartment. That, and it was, huh, it was unfurnished. So we had, to, we had to create furniture. We had to find furniture. So I, I asked the department chair if I could borrow the furniture out of the, the psychology faculty lounge. She said, sure. So after the seminar, the seminar met at night. It was about 10 o'clock at night. My students and I piled all the furniture on my car, drove it over the apartment, got it all set up. And I went home. About midnight, I get a call from campus security. And they say, we had a report that your students stole furniture from the back of the lounge. And I thought, I thought it was sort of a joke. So I said, oh, no, that, was, that wasn't my students. That was me. <laughs> yeah, because campus security had no, they had no humor. They had no sense of humor about this. And ordered me to come in at midnight and bring all the furniture back. And so the, the one advantage of teaching at a small college is that you know people. So I knew the fellow, the uh, director of, of um, um, facilities, who the, the campus security reported to. So I called him at 1 AM, woke him up. And luckily, he had a sense of humor. And uh, so I didn't get arrested. Uh, but what we did was we, we then, all, all the students had a ball. They took all the stuff out of their, their dorms, and they filled this, this, this room. We, we have three different. Uh, of these pictures, one for the living room, one for the bedroom, and one for the kitchen. They filled it up, and then we started taking pictures. And then um, after we took a picture, um, we, we reduced the level of clutter. But this is not an easy thing to do. So what we did was we buried a student in there. And then after we took the picture, she popped up and threw stuff out. Because we, we put cardboard boxes underneath most of the stuff, because we couldn't get the volume right. And she'd pull out a cardboard box so everything kind of moved down. Um, and then we created this scale. Now, this it just so happened that we get a lot of international students at Smith, and this student was the granddaughter of the king of Saudi Arabia. So we buried this Saudi Arabian princess <laughs> in all this stuff. And uh, I never got a call from the king about it, so I guess he didn't mind. But this is, this is one of the things we use now to evaluate clutter, and we just say, which of these pictures looks most like your living room? And the person can say, and they're pretty accurate about it, because we compared it to our assessments when we go to their home. So, uh, um, 
And then we have a, a self-report, saving inventory revised, and these are cutoffs for each of the subscales. We have one for excessive acquisition, one for difficulty discarding, one for clutter. All of these are available on the International OCD Foundation website if you want to use them. Um, <clears throat> and then we have an activities of daily living. This is slightly different. Here we're looking at what activities are interfered with because of the hoarding behavior. Uh, for example, can you eat at a table? Can you prepare food? Can you use your refrigerator? And we have, we have questions like that for the kitchen, the bathroom, and the common areas of the house. Okay, <clears throat> so why do, why do people do this? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to go a little quicker because I have this tendency, you may have noticed, to tell stories. <laughs> and so I'll try to restrain myself. But uh, there are a, a number of things that go into this. A and first of all, we know that there is a biological vulnerability here. There are certain neural mechanisms involved where, the, where what's happening in the brain is different for these people at times when they're trying to make decisions about objects. We, we think there may, be some kind, there, there may be some evolutionary biology, you know, certain animals hoard things, and maybe this is some kind of aberrant fixed action pattern that's, that's come down through the evolutionary chain, although we really have no evidence for this, but it sort of makes sense in theory. We do have evidence for a genetic component to hoarding. And it looks like a major portion of this, at least, uh, at least up to 50% by one estimate of the variability in hoarding behavior may be genetically determined. We've known from the beginning that runs in families, and, and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a bit more about that. In terms of core beliefs and psychological vulnerabilities, there's a lot of issues related to self-worth, a lot of issues related to feeling helplessness, uh, mood and comorbidity are all associated here. So all of these things may be vulnerability factors. Again, the research is so new, that we don't know for sure whether these are vulnerability factors or whether these are products of the hoarding behavior. If you've been hoarding for 30 years and you've never been able to control it, wouldn't you feel helpless? So it may be that these are products rather than vulnerability factors. We just don't know yet, so we're including them here. The other thing that's really uh, quite dramatic is the information processing deficits that we see. And we, we've already talked about some of the attention problems that we see, attention deficit disorder. There, there also seems to be an attentional bias going on when people evaluate an object, and that bias is for the unique and unusual detail of objects, like the shape and the color of those bottle caps. That, that her paying attention to all those things was a part of the process of information that's, that she's engaging, uh, that she's using. So that creative bias leads her into thinking about those things, and then those things lead her off into other things, okay? The other part of this attentional phenomenon is what we often see in ADHD kids as well, is sort of the opposite of this distractibility that we think of when we think of ADHD, where we have a hyper-focus of attention. And this happens usually when someone with a hoarding problem is acquiring something. What happens is they see the thing they want to buy, or they want to pick up, and they they, are thinking about all the details related to this thing, but what is lost to them is the context of their life. So they're not thinking about the fact that they don't have room for it, they don't have money for it, they already have a dozen of these things. None of that information is accessible to them. The only thing that's accessible is how wonderful this uh, thing appears and how great a bargain it is for me to buy it. Okay? So that, uh, that hyper-focus of attention is, is one of the features that we see. Now that is critical for us in figuring out how to intervene because we've got to stop that somehow, right? Categorization. You'll, 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 you'll get what I mean in a second here. All of us, or most of us, live our lives categorically. So we get an electricity bill, we put it with the other bills in a category. If we want to find it six months from now, we go to where that category is located, and we can find it. So everything is categorized. But people like Irene and people who hoard don't live their lives categorically. They live their lives visually and spatially. So for Irene, when she gets an electricity bill, she puts it on top of the pile where she can see it. And now once it's there, she now cr has created a mental map 
of all the stuff in that pile. Because she knows that tire sale ad is there. She knows that resort ad is there. She knows that that brochure about how to talk to your kids about drugs is there and approximately where it is. She has a mental map of this. That's her organizational scheme. Not the categorical scheme. She can't tolerate the categorical scheme. It's this visual space. She lives her life. She organizes her life visually and spatially with this mental map. And that's why if anyone goes into her house and touches or moves something, it is so upsetting to her. You've probably all noticed that this in hoarding cases. Anytime you touch it, it's just it's because the experience for them would be the same thing as if you came into, if they came into your house and dumped out your file cabinet with all your categories and mixed them all up. Because once someone has moved the stuff in their pile, the map is destroyed. Okay? So this unusual behavior, I mean, it looks crazy for people to be so upset about someone just touching something, but it's because it destroys their, their organization. Um, so that's a, that's a piece, uh, that's a, a way in which this information is being processed. Memory, we, we've seen examples of using objects as memory aids, as prompting memory, as, as reminders, as tags for personal history. Perception, one of the things that's, that's really odd is something that we call clutter blindness. And Irene had it, and she's, she said this, she said, look, when I'm here by myself, I feel fine. I enjoy, my, I enjoy my house. When you show up, she's talking to me, when you show up, I notice the clutter and I feel horrible. It makes me depressed. As long as you're here, I notice it and I feel awful. And then when you leave, I don't notice the clutter anymore and I feel good. Not the best therapeutic relationship. When the therapist shows up, she feels depressed. When I leave, she feels good. Uh, but it's this funny kind of perception, and we see it also when we, when we go out the first time, we often take pictures. We bring them back to the clinic, and the next time we see the person in the clinic, we show them the picture of their home. And we get this frequent reaction. It's quite unusual. The person looks at the picture and says, that's not my house. My house does not look that bad. That looks horrible. There, it's as though seeing this picture, uh, seeing this two-dimensional image, is like seeing her home through someone else's eyes, through my eyes. And that has a, can have a dramatic effect on people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. The question is, has anyone looked at spatial abilities? And, and no one has. It's, a, it's, a, it's something, again, all this research is new. So it is something that's worth looking into, but no one's done it yet. All we have are these, these observations to sort of set up where we're going. And this model, this uh, cognitive behavioral model, kind of organizes it and allows us to generate hypotheses like this that then someone can go on. Exactly. It could be that they don't see the same picture. That's exactly right. The association here is what I talked about earlier. When you pay attention to all these unusual de details, once you have an unusual detail, that leads you to another thought and another thought and another thought. All these associations expand the amount of information that they're having to process. So someone like Irene, who's processing information about something she's looking at, she's processing far more information about this object than anyone else would. And that complexity of thought is what we think makes the decision so difficult to make. Because the thinking process is far more complex than it is for the rest of us, the thinking process about objects. Now, there are also emotional attachments and beliefs about objects. We've talked about a number of them, the beauty and aesthetics piece, the memory, utility, and opportuni opportunity is a big one. Irene said it quite eloquently. She said, you know, life is a river of opportunities, and all these things I own are opportunities. It, it, they're like a river running through my house, and I just want to stop it long enough to take advantage of all of them. Uh, so it's hard for her to give up any opportunity. But in doing so, in not giving up opportunities, she's preventing herself from enjoying any of them because of the, her home is filling up. A number of these others, uh, 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 there are some other examples we'll get to in a few minutes as we go through, but we need to move on. 
Uh, in addition to these things, there are learning processes that go on. The first is negative reinforcement. You guys remember from your introductory psychology class in college what negative reinforcement is? That's when a behavior is, reinf a behavior is reinforced if that behavior removes an aversive stimulus. Right? So, Irene's behavior of picking up that ATM envelope and putting it back on the, on the pile would be a reinf negatively reinforcing, reinforced behavior because it is removing this horrible feeling that she's losing that day of her life. So the avoidance behavior she engages in is all negative reinforcement for this behavior. The other thing we see is positive reinforcement. Now we think of positive reinforcement, yeah, when you collect something you like it, when you save something it's because you like it. But there's, it's, it's a little bit different than that. Okay, and let me, let me try to artic articulate it. So, <clears throat> we all um, say, we all save things we use, right? And so our use of those things reinforces our saving behavior. And if we don't use something, eventually we let it go because we don't get ever re any reinforcement from it because we don't use it. But Irene and people like her are not reinforced by the use of their things. It's not the use of things that's reinforcing. It's the idea of things. As an example. Irene has 300 cookbooks. She ha saves every recipe in the newspaper every day. She saves every magazine, the whole magazine, if it has a recipe in it. But she never cooks. She never cooks. She can't. So what's reinforcing here? What's happening with her is every time she looks at a cookbook, every time she looks at a recipe, she thinks to herself how great it would be for me to fix this recipe for a dinner party for my friends and have them over to my house. And for that moment, Irene is the person she wants to be. She is a great cook. She's a great entertainer, a great dinner party thrower. All the things she wants in her life are there for her in that moment in her mind. So what's reinforcing about these things are the dreams they allow her to dream and not the realities they offer. Now our task for her is somehow to turn this around, to make the doing of it, to make the cooking the reinforcing part rather than the dreaming about cooking. Now there are some other things that are part of this learning process. When people don't throw things away, they don't have any opportunity to test their beliefs and appraisals. And you can see people who've been doing this for decades who forget how to throw things away. It seems like a simple behavior, but they've lost it. There's no, alternative, no opportunity for them to develop alternative beliefs about their possessions either. There's no opportunity for her to experience the fact that she's not really losing anything if she throws away a menu or a recipe, okay? If she doesn't ever throw anything away, she doesn't learn that it's not gonna matter. So this is what, we, what, what this looks like in a graphic form. And, and when we do therapy, and we do other interventions, we use this and we have people fill in the blocks for themselves about how all these things are tied together. The idea is to provide them with some way of understanding what's happening to them. Because they need to understand it in order to change their own behavior. Okay, so let me move now into more intervention things, how to talk to someone with a wording problem. There are some mistaken assumptions people have. There are issues related to motivation and ambivalence, teamwork and harm reduction um, approaches. So mistaken assumptions, many people assume that this is a behavior that is basically laziness or messiness. And we know that that's not the case. Irene works very hard at trying to control this and simply cannot do it. A another is low standards. And we know that's not true. These people tend to be highly perfectionistic and have high standards for themselves and perhaps too high standards because they can't tolerate not meeting those standards. The third kind of assumption is that if we go in and clean out the person's house, it's going to make a difference. 90% of the time, 
It doesn't. In fact, it's counterproductive. What happens if you go in and clean out the house, you're changing the condition of the property for a short period of time, but you're not changing the person's behavior. To get rid of this problem in the long term, their behavior has to change. If we go in and do something for them, their behavior will not change, and the problem will be back. So early on in our, in our interviews with uh, health department officials, a town near Northampton where I live, small town of about 10,000 people, had a hoarding case. They spent $16,000 going in and cleaning out this house. 18 months later, they're back, and it's as bad as it was at the beginning. Very uh, a common occurrence when relying on cleanouts to, to do something about this problem. Motivation's an issue. It kind of reminds me of a, a Dilbert cartoon, where, where Dilbert goes to his boss, and his boss says, here's the thing that will motivate you for the next year. Overcome the thing you fear the most. Isn't that what we're asking these people to do? And Dilbert says, whoa, motivation feels much different from what I imagined. I was imagining a light, uh, uh, expecting a light, energetic feeling. But it's more like being pinned under a burning couch. And Dilbert says, I I'm getting dizzy. I better lie down until the motivation wears off. Um, <coughs> motivation is an and insight. I'm tying the two of them together because it's a fascinating um, um, issue with hoarding behavior. It goes back to your question uh, earlier on. And, and, and it comes down to why people don't change. And really, when we think about it, if any of you have done motivational interviewing, it's really at the core of what I'm talking about here. People don't change because the costs of changing outweigh the benefits of change, at least in their mind. And that's a key to keep in mind. In hoarding, we have this, this belief, and the belief is widespread by um, people who deal with folks who have a hoarding problem, by mental health professionals, that people who hoard lack insight. That is, they lack a recognition of the nature of this problem. In fact, when we ask family members, over half of them say that their loved one with hoarding has very poor or delusional levels of insight. Um, and now when we think about insight, however, it's, it's really not clear exactly what we mean. In, in the mental health world, insight is, is, is the, the classic notion is one that's referred to as adnosagnosia, the inability to know. And the, in its purest form, this is what people with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders experience. They've got no idea what's going on. Um, or they're completely indifferent to consequences. But when you think about it, this issue of clutter blindness, isn't that a form of insight problem? Where when, when, when I'm not there, Irene doesn't notice the clutter. And when I show up, she notices it. So is that insight? That typically is what, what people think about as insight. The other is th these beliefs that people have about possessions, that I need this brochure, I'm going to keep it for the rest of my life. I need it, I'll need it someday, okay, so I can't throw it away. Is that a, a, an insight problem? Because you know I don't need it. Um, so is that an insight problem or is it just part and parcel of the disorder? It comes back to this issue. The other has to do with defensiveness. So if I am a housing official and I've gotten a complaint about a person and I knock on their door and I say, listen, We've got a complaint from, the, from your landlord about all the stuff that you've got and how that's a real problem. What is this person going to say? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I've got a problem. I'll take care of it right away. No. <laughs> that's not what they're going to say. Okay? What they're going to say is, no, I don't have a problem. Now, what I, I see uh, lots of times these same people, if I go to them, and, and I don't go as an official, I go and say, you know, I'm really interested in your experience of all this, what it's like for you. Then they're more likely to open up to me, okay? So in that sense, th there's a defensiveness that gets in the way of our uh, ability to understand what is a lack of insight and what's not. Um, now, uh, to, to characterize this, let me turn now to motivation because it's very closely related. There are two things that are required for people to make a change. One is that the change is important enough to them. And the second thing is that they have confidence that they can change. Now, what do I mean by importance? What I mean is there is a discrepancy between where they are right now in their life and where they want to be. 
The bigger that discrepancy, the more pressure there is, the more motivation there is to change. Okay? So one of the things that is crucial for us in dealing with someone who is unmotivated is we have to increase this discrepancy. All right? So that gives us some ideas about where we can go with someone who isn't motivated to do anything about the problem. We've got to create a discrepancy. Okay, now once that discrepancy is created, okay, there will be, I guarantee you, there will be something the person does to reduce that discrepancy. And what they do depends on how much confidence they have that they can change. If they have confidence that they can change, they're going to change their behavior, they're going to change what they're doing now to come closer to matching that goal they have. But if they have no confidence that they can change, what are they going to do? I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to start saying, they're going to do something to reduce the discrepancy. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, well, you know what? Um, maybe this isn't so bad. Or they're going to say, you know, I really like this. Or they're going to say, you know what? This is your problem, not mine. Leave me alone. Isn't this what we hear from folks? Maybe that's not insight. Maybe it's the fact that they are attempting to reduce the discrepancy they've got between where they are now and where they want to be. And we need to come up with a way of giving them a different way of reducing that discrepancy, a way in which their behavior changes rather than they're, they're thinking their way out of this discrepancy. And again, as you think about your cases where people aren't motivated, think, it, think about it in these terms. We, this is uh, uh, straight out of motivational interviewing, which was developed for people with uh, uh, substance abuse problems. We see the same kinds of phenomena. This is a client-centered uh, directive method of enhancing intrinsic motivation by uh, uh, to change by exploring and resolving ambivalence. And what is ambivalence? Ambivalence is the holding of seemingly conflicting ideas. Okay? So for Irene, I want to change my home so that my husband won't leave, but I don't want to get rid of any of my stuff. Two conflicting motives at the same time. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and, and we know that people with hoarding problems have that ambivalence because of what Anita mentioned earlier. They know that other people view their life in a certain way. And if someone came into their house, they would feel shame. And that tells us they, they have some degree of insight, okay? Uh, they feel shame when other people see their home. They feel depressed when other people come into their home, okay? Now, but, but uh, okay, now, as a psychologist, it may sound funny, but, but maybe this is what we should be doing, is bringing people into their home so they feel this because that's where the discrepancy is. Going into the home means they're going to experience where they're at now in a more vibrant way than it having no... And, and I can tell you, people with hoarding problems, if, especially if they're severe, they, have no, they will have no one in their home for decades. The longer they go without anyone in their home, the worse they get. So if, nothing, if you do nothing else with these folks, get someone into their home. That person doesn't have to talk about hoarding at all, doesn't have to do anything. Just get someone to go into their home regularly and often and you will see change. Because it highlights the discrepancy, okay? This is where we've got to start with these folks. We want to make a change, is with this discrepancy issue. Um, <clears throat> and now, with related, related to this ambivalence notion, what all of us are trained as, as helping professionals, right? And, and we're trained to, to help someone in the simplest and quickest way possible. And so if you walk into someone's home that's absolutely full and they're having trouble throwing things away, what's the single most important piece of advice you could get them to change? Hey, just throw it out, right? That's everyone's first inclination to say. But what are they going to say? Well, I can't throw it out because of X, Y, and Z. And so what do I say? Well, I say, well, A, B, and C. 
And so you should throw it out. So I start an argument. And what I'm doing as a helper is I'm trying to tell you how you should change and what you should do. And they're telling me why they can't do it. So I'm rehearsing all the reasons why they should change, but what are they doing? They're rehearsing all the reasons why they shouldn't change. That's not going to get us anywhere. What we have to do is we have to turn the tables and have them be the ones to argue for change. This was really dramatic, brought home dramatic for me early on in our, in our first treatment study where I'm supervising therapists and we have this therapist who's a fabulous guy, fabulous therapist, treating OCD patients and he's great at it. He's treating this woman for hoarding. She's in her mid-30s, got a pretty serious hoarding problem in her apartment. Uh, and and she, you know, they have a great relationship. This client really likes her therapist and he likes her. And so it's, it, it, but, but their working relationship is characterized by his going in and arguing why she should throw these things out. They're picking up things and, and he's making the arguments for throwing them out and she's making the arguments for keeping them. And occasionally she'll throw something out just to keep him happy, but no change is going on. So I said, look, it, 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 let's turn the tables here, try something different. I said, this time, at this next session, I want you to argue that she should keep something and see what she does. So he goes in and she comes in and she pulls out her grandmother's dress. Now her grandmother was her favorite person, died within the last year and, and she got a lot of her grandmother's stuff. This is one of her grandmother's favorite dresses. And so the therapist says, well, you know, that belonged to your grandmother. She was really special. You have to keep that. And what does she say? Well, you know, I've got a lot of stuff in my grandmother's and, you know, this was just a dress. I've got other dresses. I've got other things. So I, I don't know that I need to keep this. It is this ambivalence that plays out. And what we do with our therapists is we tell them, look, if you find yourself trying to convince someone that they should be doing something, you're on the wrong track. You're going to lose. Because, yeah, they may give in now and then just to keep you happy, but they're not going to change their behavior until they're the ones who make the arguments for change. OK. I'm telling stories again, and you're not stopping me. Uh, the style of motivational interviewing is collaborative, not confrontational. And that's the place we should start. And when we come off in a confrontational way, what happens is that we are creating this um, adversary relationship. Um, this is evocative. We, we try to go in not as experts, not as authorities, uh, and to provide them with, uh, with autonomy. Um, <clears throat> let me move through these. One of the things I, I would encourage you to do is pick up, there's a book called uh, Digging Out. It's by uh, Michael Tompkins and Tam Hartle, um, published in 2009. It's all, it, it's about two things. One, it's about family and, and, and how family members can help in this process. And it's about developing a harm reduction approach to serious hoarding problems. Now, what I mean by harm reduction approach is that beginning the process, not by going in and clearing the person out, not by coming in in a more heavy-handed way, but by coming in and reducing the potential harm. Okay, where are the trouble spots in this? Where are the trouble spots in Irene's house? The first one, obviously, is by the stove. So the first thing we want to do, okay, where, where else can we put all those clean papers that are by, lined up by the stove? Let's find another place for them. So what we're doing here, we're not, we're not starting with her throwing stuff out. We're starting with her moving stuff to a different place that's safer. Okay, the next thing we want to do, okay, well, you know, we've got this door that's blocked that you can't get out of. Where can we put the stuff that's in front of the door so you can get out? And once we have the harm, the risk of harm reduced to an acceptable level, then we can start the process of figuring out the nature of this attachments, the, the attachments to possessions and what to do about them. We're buying ourselves time. We're reducing the danger and then buying ourselves a relationship with the person where we can, we can help them uh, work through this. And, and in, the, in the Tompkins and Hartle book, they talk about these steps, lith, listening, empathizing, affirming, redirecting, uh, and negotiating. I won't go through them now because there are other things I want to get to, but, but take a look at it. Quite good. There are some communicating do's and don'ts. We want to try to seek to understand the person's perspective instead of telling them. You have to clear this area or you'll fail the next inspection. We don't want to do that because we want, we, want to get, we want to get their impressions of things. 
I see you have some books by the window here. What led you to put them there? What are the consequences of putting them there? Do you think it's dangerous to have them there? What happens if you need to get out the window? So forth and so on. Questions, not directives. Okay. Um, <clears throat> use I statements to express concern. Well, I'm worried that if you don't clear this area, you won't pass the inspection. I don't know what the inspector will say about this. What do you think they'd say about this? Again, if we're going to make a statement, make a statement about what I think, not about your behavior, but about the world. You know, what, is, what do you think the inspector, I, I, I wonder whether the inspector would not like this, so forth. Um, avoid telling them what they should keep or how they should dispose of it. You have so many empty boxes, just get rid of them and then you'll have so much more room. Okay? Again, this is arguing for change and we, don't, we want them to make the argument for change. How can you create some more space here? So we're basically presenting them with the problem and asking them for a solution. How would you create more space, living space in your home? And get them started with the process of figuring out, well, how do I do that? Uh, we use a, a decisional balance sheet often, and, and here we, we want to make sure, because what happens is usually what, what therapists will often do if they don't have experience with this is they'll focus on this, and they'll focus on this, and they won't focus on these two, okay? And we want to focus on all of them. We want to we start here because we want to understand this person's perspective because they need to understand their perspective in order to change. We spend a lot of time establishing goals and values, and, and so this it works. It's pretty powerful. We think these are people who are in their 50s, 60s, most of them, and we say to them, look, how much time do you have left in this life of yours? 10 years? 20 years? What do you want to do with that last 10 years of your life? How do you want to spend it? Do you want to spend it here with this stuff? Or do you want to, how, how, and what we get is the kind of thing you can imagine will come from all of us. I want to spend it with my family. I want to spend it with people who are important. And the, once we have that, that's something we can hang everything else on. Okay, so yeah, you want to spend time with your family. So how is it that, you know, your, your children, won't bring over your grandchildren because of all the stuff in the room. How does all, having all this stuff match with this goal? And doesn't this, does it get in the way of, of your experiencing this goal that you have for yourself? Okay? So it's one way we use personal goals to try to keep people motivated. There are some other factors. How much social support the person has. Are there any home visitors? I mentioned home visitors before. Because, in, in truth, there is one and maybe only one law of human behavior. If someone is coming to your home, what do you do? You clean up. It's true people who hoard and people who don't. Even our worst cases, when we show up at their house, they're exhausted. They say, I just spent the last three hours trying to clean up. The one law of human behavior, and we should be capitalizing on it for these folks. Uh, other factors uh, are, are there. Now, what, what we, uh, what is a good way, a, a good model, and I said I'm not going to talk about therapy per se. I'll mention it here and there, but I'm not talking about how we do therapy because it's not accessible to a lot of people. But there are things that we can do outside of a therapy context that will work. And one is this uh, using teamwork from multiple perspectives. And we want to know the individual's perspective, the family's perspective, the agency's perspective, multiple agencies, and the neighbor's perspective, all of these things can be useful to us in understanding and figuring out what to do. And each person plays a separate role. There's an enforcement role here. And there, there is, the, the enforcement can be a, motiv a, a very strong motivational tool to get someone started in changing their life. And so we, using those enforcement tools, but it has to be done in the right way. It cannot be done in a really sort of authoritarian, sort of good guy, uh, bad cop, good cop way. Can't really take the bad cop role because you'll alienate people. You've got to be supportive yet firm uh, but, and, and in applying these enforcement principles. But they have to be there. They have to be there for these folks. Uh, and once we have this enforcement pressure, there has to be resources. Now this is, where, this is what it comes down to, isn't it? Right? For all of you. You, you all face this, and, and the single most difficult thing is there are no resources for these people. There aren't enough therapists to see them. 
that, uh, that know what they're doing. There aren't, there's enough money. They don't have enough money for therapy. Uh, maybe no time, whatever. So where do you get the resources? All right, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, family members play some role, but it's really, really hard for family members to play a role here because there are typically decades worth of conflict. And you got to, the family members have to work through the, that conflict before they can really be terribly helpful. So it's really hard for family members to participate in this. I mentioned the harm reduction approach, looking at, you know, safety, health, function. Okay, we focus a lot on function. What can't you do? For Irene, okay, what can't you do that, because of all this stuff that you'd really like to do? Well, you know, I really would like to be a good cook. I'd really like to have a dinner party. That's function. And we focus on function. Well, okay, let's see what we can do in your home so that you can have a dinner party. Now, notice I didn't say, let's throw out a bunch of stuff so you can have people over. I said, what can we do to rearrange your house so you can have a dinner party? That's the, the problem for her perspective is not the amount of stuff, it's that she can't have a dinner party. So we start with her problem and let her come to the conclusion that she's got to get rid of stuff. Uh, uh, comfort, financial issues are also important here in harm reduction. Uh, in putting this together, uh, 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 Tompkins and Hartle suggest coming up with these worksheets where we're, we're actually looking at a safety target, we're rating the risk, so this tells us where we need to start. Okay? Path in the living room two feet wide, this is a high risk. Material blocking the rear exit, high risk. These are the things you need to be focused on right away, so forth. So we can create this kind of plan with the person, okay? Because they've got to sign on to this. Now, here's, uh, here is the, the, the sort of guts of what I want to I talk about with respect to um, what you can do outside of the context of cognitive behavior therapy for helping these people. And that is what we're trying to do in, in Northampton through the Hoarding Task Force is to create a community-based response for doing this. And uh, one of the things, and this is drawn from a couple places, uh, in San Francisco now, the, the Hoarding Task Force there has created a hoarding response team. This hoarding response team is made up of four individuals, each of whom has a serious hoarding problem. And when an agency runs into a case that is difficult for them to handle, they can't get in the door and so forth, they call the hoarding response team. And these people go, they knock on the door, look, I've been where you are. I am where you are. I have this problem. Let's talk about it because these people, they're going to come back. And they're going to come back again and again. And we've been through that. And we know what it's like. And we want to help you work your way through it. Okay? This hoarding response team has so far, been, been um, very successful in, in generating cases to, to get started with. And again, it's a new idea. It does require a little bit of resources, but not a lot. Okay? Uh, so that's one idea. The other idea, and I'm going to talk more about this, hopefully, if I, if I can stay away from stories, I, I get to the Buried and Treasures workshop. This is something that we've been working on in, uh, where I am in Northampton. And it is a workshop where we use our self-help book, Buried in Treasures. The workshop is facilitated by a peer, someone with a hoarding problem. And it is time limited. It's not like a support group. It's very different from a support group because it's action oriented. The people are not getting together to complain. They're not getting together to just emote. They're getting together to do the activities that are outlined in Buried in Treasures. Each week is a different chapter of the book. They read the chapter, they do the exercises in the book, they report on it to their group, okay? And we've had remarkable success with it. So these Buried in Treasures workshop now is structured to be 15 sessions long to run 20 weeks. And I'll show you the data in just a minute, what we've got. So that's a second piece of what can be a community response. A th another piece, a third piece is creating uh, uh, some case managers. Now, some of you may have already done something like this. We've had great luck by training people. Mostly they've been my students, my undergraduate students. At, they learned something about hoarding. Many of them were in my seminar. Uh, others who aren't get a, a day and a half training workshop. And they become interns for different organizations. So the health our health department called one day. They said, look, we have this case, this woman in her 30s, we're going to condemn her home because it's awful. 
and we're going to, she's going to be out on the street. This was a, a high functioning woman. She was a, a concert pianist. Um, she's going to be out on the street because we're going to condemn her home unless you, you've got some ideas for me. It's the health agent. And I said, okay, well, why don't we take a couple of my students and let them spend some time with her? And so they went over twice a week for about a month. At the end of the month, her home passed inspection. Not house beautiful, but it passed inspection. And so the health department was quite happy. This is another way to pair up with universities around who've got students who can do this, volunteer internships, with just a day and a half or two days of training and some interest on their part. And you can have a, a, an intervention that will make an effect in some people's lives. Maybe not everyone will accept it, but what we found is uh, pretty successful. The other thing that we're working up now is an Unburied from Treasures support group. This is designed to follow the Buried in Treasures workshop. People do well in the workshop, but once the workshop ends, they need something more. So we developed this support group to follow on. We'll have the uh, ability to talk about that perhaps in a minute. And we also have uh, cognitive behavior therapy, but I, as I said, I'm not going to talk too much about that because that is available when, when, um, if, if people have the resources. <coughs> okay? So let me, let me t show you, let me switch. I'm not going to go into the details of the program, but let me go right to the data. This is our first project uh, that we did with the Buried in Treasures workshop. And you can see we're getting, over the course, and this is only 13 weeks. We've stretched it out now to 20 weeks. But 13 weeks, we, sh we see a pretty big reduction in all three of these manifestations, clutter, difficulty discarding, and acquisition. So this was our first uh, s a set of studies on this, and we were quite pleased with the results. Uh, and now, this is our, our recent study, and this is now under review for publication, where we are comparing the effects of the Buried in Treasures workshop to a wait list. And again, this is only 13 weeks. We've stretched it out now a little farther. Thir for, so for 13 weeks, what we see is basically no change in the people who are assigned to the wait list. And for people who are assigned to the Buried in Treasures workshop, we see a reduction in hoarding symptoms of about 33%, which is big. It's a pretty big reduction over a 20-week period of time. That is almost as much of a reduction as we get with cognitive behavior therapy uh, for 26 weeks. So there's something quite powerful about these Buried in Treasures workshops. Um, now, the Buried in Treasures workshop, and these are the percentage of responders that we get. So by self-report, 89% of the people who went through the workshop described themselves as much or very much improved. And an assessor actually went to their home and interviewed them in the home and surveyed the home. Over 60% were cl classified as much or very much improved. For a, for a program that did not include a therapist and included a peer facilitator, this is pretty impressive. Uh, uh, outcome. This is a pretty impressive outcome for limited resources. So you got no resources. What, what we do have in terms of resources is people. People with this problem. Maybe we don't have professionals as resources because they cost money. People with this problem may be willing to do it for no money or little money. In this case, we paid our facilitator. Uh, and what we are doing now, uh, uh, well, here, here, here's a quote from one of the people in the group. I first read the book and revved up my uncluttering, read Buried in Treasures by herself. But when I reread the book with my support group and did all the exercises, I understood myself better. I didn't just clear out some space. I changed. And that's what we're after, because clearing space isn't going to do it. Change is what we're after. Now, for this Buried in Treasures workshop, we have, uh, the, it's based on the self-help book. Each week you go through a different chapter. But more than that, because we want, we want other people to be able to apply it in the way in which we applied it here, we've created a facilitator's guide, a step-by-step -step approach that, set, that tells you every single thing you need to do to set up one of these groups and run it. And that facilitator's guide is available on the International OCD Foundation website, ocfoundation.org. And you can find the facilitator's guide there. It includes everything you need to know, all down to the details of how many pencils to bring. Uh, so once you have that facilitator's guide, it's really a matter of, of setting this up and running it. Now, it's better if you've had someone with some facilitating experience. The fellow who ran our weightless control group was a, a peer facilitator. 
Um, so he had done some, peer, some facilitating of groups before, uh, and he was pretty good at it. But uh, it, it's possible for anyone to pick up this facilitator's guide and run it. OK. Uh, so these things are all things we've talked about. Concluding, uh, hoarding is a common chronic and debilitating problem. It negatively affects the individual, the family, and the community. It has unique biological, cognitive, emotional, behavioral features. And a team-oriented, multiple-layered approach is needed. And that's what we need in, a, in, a, in doing this. We need to think a little bit outside the box in creating intervention strategies. Thank you. And, uh, and um, let me open it up here for questions. <laughs>